Welcome back. This video is going to talk about autocorrelation coefficients. So in a previous video, I said that one of the things that makes time series analysis especially challenging is that our observations can be correlated over time. Likewise, when we fit regression models on this, the errors are correlated with each other, which violates one of the assumptions that we've made with um, or less regression. So what I want to talk about in this video is how do we detect when, um, you know, when we've got this problem of correlations between our, our observations or the errors. And so the, the main or the kind of the first diagnostic that we're going to be using on this to detect this problem is called the autocorrelation coefficient. And so one of the first things that, that you're going to do whenever you're analyzing uh, time series data is to look at the autocorrelations. Um, when you fit a model, like a regression model with time series data, you're going to want to be studying these autocorrelations. So what is an autocorrelation? Before I get into that, let me um, review briefly what, uh, what a correlation is. So from basic stats, uh, you know, we learned that the Pearson correlation between two variables, say x and y, is just the covariance of the variables divided by the standard deviations of the, um, of the, uh, of the, of the two variables. And so what's, what's, um, uh, you know, what's happening is we're just looking at how far x is from its mean how far y is from its mean. You divide by the standard deviation, you get basically a z-statistic for the x's and a z-statistic for the y's. You compute the products and you find the average of them and it's kind of like, uh, you know, the expected uh, value of the product of the z-statistics. That's the way I think of a, of a Pearson correlation. Well, um, in order to get to an autocorrelation coefficient, let me first define um, the autocovariance with a particular lag. Okay, so the autocovariance is just going to be the covariance between, you know, some, some um, you know, y sub t and y sub t lagged uh, k cases. That should be y sub t, not y sub k. I'll fix that before I send that out. All right. Um, so this is just the, you know, how much does one observation relate to the next one? That would be the first order autocovariance. How much does one observation relate with, you know, two observations later? That would be the second. So k equal to two lags uh, autocovariance. All right, now with that defined, we can, um, we can now look at the autocorrelation of order k. So k is going to be the number of lags. And so this is just the correlation between y sub t and, you know, go back k lags. So what is the correlation between those two? So how am I going to define, you know, this? Well, it's going to be the autocovariance um, divided by the, so the standard deviation of y minus k is the same as the standard deviation of y t. So the standard deviations of these two pieces are the same. And therefore, I'm just going to stick the variance down there. Now, the variance we could, you know, it's really just gamma, gamma zero. The autocovariance with zero lags gives us the variance. And so that's, that's what an autocorrelation is. And we can estimate it with the following formula. Um, if you, you can try it in R and you'll, um, you'll get exactly what the uh, autocorrelation function gives if you use this formula. Now, um, as, as I mentioned a minute ago, we're, we're often more interested in residuals than the y's, and so often we're going to be computing these autocor, you know, the correlations for the, for the residuals from our models, and not the original y values. Now, um, kind of the takeaway from this diagnostic is that when you've got substantial autocorrelations, um, a couple things happen. So first, your confidence intervals and hypothesis tests from a regression are not going to be correct because all of those uh, confidence intervals and hypothesis tests make an assumption that you've got 
you know, uh, uh, you know, uncorrelated data. You, know, you're, you're, you don't have a correlation between observations. And so those are going to be wrong. And you're going to need to do something to fix that. So you would never trust um, a confidence interval for a regression coefficient if you find that you've got autocorrelated errors. Um, a second thing is it's signaling to you that there's an opportunity to take advantage of this. If you can model, um, you know, build a model that incorporates this information that is between observations, you're going to get better forecasts. So those are the two implications. Whenever you've got autocorrelations, number one, don't trust your confidence intervals. Number two, um, you should really be modeling it to take advantage of it. All right. So in R, there's um, a bunch of autocorrelation functions. There's little ACF, there's big ACF, and then there's GGACF. They all basically do the same thing. Um, they compute the autocorrelations for you and also generate uh, a plot of the autocorrelation function. So the autocorrelation function plots these autocorrelations as a function of the number of lags. Um, when you look at the plots, you're going to get some blue lines that indicate whether or not the covariance, the, the autocorrelations uh, are significantly different from zero. So let's go look at two um, autocorrelation function plots. Um, the first is with the difference uh, stock price of Google. And so I, I went over this back in the first video this week, and I said it's random noise. Okay, so what that means is there are no autocorrelations. Um, that, that claim that I made is kind of backed up when we look at the ACF or the autocorrelation function. And so what you're going to see is um, the correlation between any observation and the observation next to it, that would be the first lag, is tiny. And it's between the blue lines indicating it's not significant. Um, the second autocorrelation is how does the current observation correlate with two periods ago? And you'll see it's tiny. Don't need to worry about it. And if we go back three periods, don't need to worry about it. Four periods. And so basically, none of these autocorrelate because of that 20 period. Um, none of these have any you know, substantial correlations that are significantly different from zero. And so this is an example of a white noise process where there's, there's really nothing going on. Uh, there, you know, there, there, there is no autocorrelation between the observations. More on white noise processes in my next video. Okay, compare that with the uh, Treasury uh, bill data, the T-bill data, where this was like the, um, the interest rate on a three-month T-bill. And so back when we looked at this plot in the first video, we saw a cyclical pattern. Um, and so maybe let's just go take a look at that again. Uh, here was that cyclical pattern. Uh, it kind of goes up for a while, then it goes down for a while. What this is saying is, you know, if, if it's kind of high this month or this year, chances are it's going to be high next year. All right. And if it's, if it's below average this year, chances are it's going to be below average next year. You know, that would be a correlation between successive observations. Okay. So we saw that in that, uh, in that plot as opposed to the Google plot, where it's, it's, it's just squiggles there. There's, there's nothing happening. Um, so the fact that we, we, um, we, we saw that with our, um, with our time series plot uh, suggests there's probably some autocorrelations. Well, when we actually go look at the autocorrelation plot, sure enough, we see some very large autocorrelations. And so if you print what comes out of the ACF function, you actually get the autocorrelation. So if you have, how, how does an observation correlate with itself? Well, the correlation's one. That's not very interesting. But how does an observation correlate with one observation next to it? And the answer is it's about 0.8. So that's a very strong correlation, and that's what we're plotting right here. Um, how does the, an observation correlate with one two periods away, two years away? Uh, well, the correlation drops to 0.53, but that's still pretty substantial, all right? And so what I'm seeing here is um, th there's, there are a lot of autocorrelations in that T-build data. And, um, you know, I, I, I should be modeling that if I want to take advantage of that in building time series models. All right. So um, you'll see I actually 
tested that formula I gave you, you it by hand, you can study that on your own. I now want to go over um, a few additional tests. So these are very powerful tests that we'll often use in addition to the blue lines on an ACF plot. So the box Pierce and the Jung box test um, allow us to test whether the first H autocorrelations all simultaneously equal zero. So it's kind of like our F tests in regression uh, in that they, they test whether you know, a bunch of parameters are all simultaneously equal to zero. So the default is to only look at the most recent period and um, you know that, that's what we're getting here. You can change that with an option. Um, I don't remember the option off the top of my head. Actually, it's down here. It's lag. Lag changes uh, the number of periods. So what this is really testing is the null hypothesis that the first order autocorrelation, so back here with the T-build data, that would be this uh, 0.797 uh, cor cor you know, uh, correlation. Uh, is, is equal to zero. And um, when we do any of these tests, the p-values are, are tiny, so we reject the null hypothesis. When I do it with the, uh, the differenced Google data, you're going to see very large p-values indicating I can't reject the null hypothesis that that autocorrelation is zero. So we're going to be using these tests uh, a lot when we, when we study our residuals with, with various models. And um, we're going to use this to detect if we, um, if we have autocorrelation problems in our data. Um, I'm just going to mention one other test that um, is very famous. Uh, it's called the Durbin-Watson test. So a lot of software, for example, if you're using Python, will report the Durbin-Watson test instead of the uh, Box-Pierce test or the Jung, Box-Jung test. But... Um, uh, your, your textbook doesn't even talk about Durbin-Watson because um, these other uh, Box-Pierce, Box-Jung tests are, are uh, preferred. But um, I just wanted to make sure that you'd heard of Durbin-Watson because it's another, um, you know, uh, another test in this family. Um, Durbin-Watson only tests the first autocorrelation, um, whereas these Box-Pierce uh, and Box-Jung tests are more general. Um, but um, you've heard of it now. So finally, um, I want to go over uh, an example to hint at how we're going to be using this. So I'm going to go to the Amazon data and do the obvious thing that we would have done having come out of a basic regression class. And so what, what that would be would be, um, you know, we've we've got the heteroscedasticity, so let's log y, it's a very sta variance stabilizing transformation. I'm going to fit a trend term, and I'm going to give myself some dummies for the quarter number. So you'll see how I've extracted that with the cycle um, function and so forth. And so here's my raw data. Here's the estimated model. We see a positive trend. We see, you know, here's the Christmas effect. Is that big positive effect for the fourth quarter? Um, the other two quarters are not much different from the first, is the way I would interpret this. All right, so let's now use a, a, another command that we're going to use a lot, which is called check residuals. So check residuals gives us three plots. So let's start out with the one that we already know, which is the uh, ACF. And so what we see is there are very strong autocorrelations here. And this would tell me don't trust the p-values, don't trust any confidence intervals, all that's going to be uh, flawed because I don't have uncorrelated errors. So these are, um, you know, it's, it's the ACF of the residuals. I could do um, a test, so Broich Godfrey's another uh, one of these tests, like the, um, the Box-Pierce test, and what you, you can see is that um, if we test the null hypothesis that there are no autocorrelations up to the 10th period, um, we have a tiny p-value saying we're going to reject that null hypothesis. There are, are autocorrelations. And we see that in the ACF. Uh, this is just another way to, to tell that. 
Uh, if we did the box test, we come to the same conclusion. I should probably change my lags, um, but you know this is saying you know you 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 have it at the first period, therefore um, you you've got problems. Two more things. Um, the figure to the right is a normal. Uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a distribution a histogram with a normal curve superimposed. We don't really need normal. Uh, residuals, but um, well, depending on what we do, if we're going to make prediction intervals, we we, we do with. But um, we, we'll want to know if we if, if the residuals are normal. When I look at this, I, I see basically normal residuals, um, so that that's not an issue. Um, I want to go over this last plot with you, which is um, which is a slightly different residual plot than you've seen before. You know, usually we plot the residuals versus y hat. Here we're going to plot the residuals versus the time period. Now, what you want are residuals that are centered at zero. That's going to give you an unbiased, that means your, your regression line gives you unbiased estimates of the mean. Um, and you'd like for, you know, as always, your residuals to look like a snowstorm. You know, there's no pattern. What we're seeing here is a very strong pattern. Okay, so what we're seeing is that um, when our model starts to, um, you know, underestimate the true values, uh, all the, you know, for the next few periods, we're, we're always underestimating the true value. All right? Likewise, out here, when we us underestimate it, we tend to do that sequentially over over a block of time, and you know, this probably has something to do with with uh, with the business cycles. You know, so our model underestimates it when the economy is booming. It overestimates when we're in a uh, re recession. Um, so just, um, you know, we're going to be using this slight different, slightly different residual plot whenever we fit these models. Okay, so in summary, um, the ACF, the autocorrelation function, is going to be one of our go first go-to plots when we start analyzing a data set and when, whenever we look at the residuals from a model and um, whenever we see a pattern like this which is reflected by these patterns in the residual plots um, that means that our inference is off and we you know we have some work to do in terms of modeling it okay that's it for my uh, ACF lecture